Chill out, chill out. Now, this may come as a bit of a shock, but I was a very good kid, right? Not like a goody-goody, you know, uh, kind of that, but I, I was well-behaved. I was never what you might call a troublemaker. So it was a real adjustment when I got to college. Not for the stuff you're thinking. It's just that I noticed, looking around the classes for my major, comparative politics, the Middle East, and North Africa, that I was very distinctly in the minority. Not for being a Jew, though that's also true, but as a woman. There are relatively few women in my classes compared to the number of guys. And it was weird for me, because all my schooling till that point, you know, public school, Hebrew school, it was all 50-50. But now, in college, I was outnumbered. And it was a very interesting dynamic, the energy in the classroom of mostly young men. It was very competitive, a lot of jockeying for space to speak, a lot of jumping on each other's points, you know, every, arguing everybody's opinion, everything was an argument, making lots of little jokes and remarks. And sometimes I heard things being said that I really disagreed with, but I was always way too intimidated to speak up. It seemed like most of the women were worried like I was, uh, making myself a target for these very sharp young bucks, like I'd make myself a whole mess of trouble that I didn't want. And I remember going home once and telling my dad about this ratio, male-female, of the students, about how that was very new to me. I'd never experienced that before, and maybe I picked the wrong major. I didn't want to put my head up, you know, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with these really competitive guys and stir up trouble for myself. And my dad, who has never talked about these kinds of things with me before, said, Sarah, you have every right to be there as much as anyone else. He said, maybe it's time that you get in a little bit of a good trouble. I think my dad might have been channeling his inner Moses. Because this week, Moses is dealing with a whole bunch of men, scads of men, in fact, the young men that comprise the families of all the clans, of the tribes of Israel. He's apportioning their land, uh, all that they're going to pass down. Every guy gets some land, and he'll pass it down to his sons, and to his sons, etc., etc., etc. But there's a problem. The daughters of Tzlovchad, the tribe of Manasseh, came forward. And they said, our father died in the wilderness, and he's left no son. Let not our father's name be lost to his clan just because he has no son. Give us a portion of land among our father's kinsmen. This is a highly unusual request. In ancient times, in pretty much every culture around the world, Women could not own property, like any kind of property in general, and they certainly couldn't own immovable property like land. When a man died, only his sons would inherit. But the Torah tells us this week that this band of daughters, the five daughters of Tzlovchad, are requesting that they inherit their father's property instead of it being passed on to some random distant male relative. Moses would be well within his right to say, ladies, <laughs> please, you know how things are done. Women can't even own property. How can you inherit it? But he doesn't. He doesn't say no. He doesn't say yes. He kicks it up to his boss. It's a good, good idea. <laughs> and God immediately, immediately responds. The plea of the daughters of Slovkad is just give them a hereditary portion of land, transfer their father's share to them. Victory for the daughters of Slavchad. This is unprecedented. I, I don't know if I can impress this upon you enough, the magnitude of what just happened. Even a queen, you know, her, her, her father's only child could not inherit his land upon his death. But here you have these five common women who had the gumption to chance stirring things up going clear against the norm to petition Moses himself, and they have won that right. Unfathomable in ancient times. But there's more. Because God continues. Any householder who dies and leaves no son, you shall transfer his property to his daughter. This is a 
complete upset of the status quo of ancient society. Women had no property rights then, but God decides upon hearing Moses' presentation of the petition of the daughters of Tzlochot to upend how things have always been done in favor of changing them for the sake of these troublemakers, what my dad would call good troublemakers. Now maybe you're thinking, okay, that's a nice little Torah story. But in real life, like, you know, the rabbis and the Talmud, real guys, you know, they probably were not such big heroes to them. After all, our ancient rabbis had no use for troublemakers. They liked the status quo. Everything they decided was really to kind of maintain it, maintain peace. And you're not wrong, except in this case. The ancient rabbis, they did like to maintain a comfortable constant. Life is easier that way. But they loved them a good troublemaker, or five in this case. The five daughters of Slavchad are wise, say our ancient sages in the Talmud. They are interpreters of Jewish texts, they say, and they are righteous. They fall over themselves to praise these women. Because our ancient rabbis appreciated people who were daring enough to stand up, to make their voices heard, even if it went against the status quo. That's how things have always been done. If it meant saying something important and valuable, even, or maybe especially if it meant stirring up a little trouble, as long as it was the right kind, our rabbis were a fan. There was a difference for our ancient rabbis between good trouble and trouble for the sake of making trouble or selfish trouble. And you see it clearly in how they approach the case of the daughters of Tzlochad. They paint as a picture why we should get ourselves into good trouble. The daughters of Tzlochad Oh, the rabbis love them. They're wise and they're learned and they're righteous, the rabbis in the Talmud say. Each and every one of them, they say, which is why they were brave enough to stand up and mix it up a little. And that's why God sided with them, say the rabbis. And they changed the rule for women everywhere. But stirring things up just because you can to further some personal dream of glory, to come in with anything other than pure intentions, that's not good trouble. That's just trouble, <laughs> and that's not admirable in the least. We read that in the rabbi's explanation of how Moses, seeing that the daughters could now inherit, sees an opportunity for himself. His successor as leader of the Jewish people has already been chosen by this point in the Torah. We already know it's a very fine general named Joshua. We love Joshua, you love Joshua, the rabbis love Joshua, everybody loves Joshua. But Moses, he kind of wanted his own sons to inherit his great position in the community. So he tried to stir up a little trouble of his own when he saw what happens with the daughters of Tzlofchad. When he saw the daughters of Tzlofchad inherit the property of their father, Moses said to God, it is time for me to claim my needs. If daughters inherit, it is also right for my sons to inherit my glory. God, the rabbis explain in the Talmud, shoots this down immediately. <laughs> God says, your sons are occupied only with themselves. They do not merit overturning what is being done. In Judaism, we appreciate the good troublemakers, the ones willing to stir things up for a good cause, something important, something that betters everyone, not selfish, serving only themselves. That God cannot abide. I thought of my father's words about the value of being a good troublemaker when I had the opportunity later in my life, also while furthering my education, no longer in college, but in rabbinical school. My entering class was 13 people, 12 guys, and me. <laughs> it was an interesting and edifying experience. And for the record, they were very good guys. I'm friends with many of them to this day. I like them all. But that's a lot of testosterone in one classroom. <laughs> Class discussions are always very lively. Twelve young men, eager to prove their knowledge and their wit. Arguing text, arguing Talmud, sometimes I think just arguing for the sake of arguing. Often accompanied with the little remarks and jokes that young men often make in each other's company. I was, yet again, very intimidated. I did not want to be the target of that energy. 
I wanted to keep my head down, get my education, get ordained, and get out of there. So I really had to channel my dad's voice, telling me that I deserve space too, to speak my mind, to share my thoughts and interpretations, and to stir up a little good trouble. And I had to channel too my inner daughters of Tzlochad, who teach us that just because things are being done one way, according to one norm, doesn't mean they always must be. And that even God thinks new voices must be added to the mix, even if it means sticking your neck out a little bit. I learned, in time, to add my thoughts to the classroom discussions, to disagree when it felt necessary, and that being funny was one thing, but to not stand for disrespect. So take this as your cue. As Jews, we are meant to take as an example the daughters of Slovkad, to be good troublemakers. So be a good troublemaker. Let your voice not be silenced just because you are few or are advocating something that is different than the usual fare. The Torah teaches us that it is those who dare to raise their heads high, daring to be different, daring to claim their space for their voice, those are the ones who change the world. So go out there and make some good trouble. Shabbat Shalom.